Saturday, February 18th, 2012, there was a memorial service at the tiny New Hope Baptist Church in Newark, New Jersey. It was by no means an end, but a new beginning for millions of little girls who dare to dream. It was in these New Hope pews that a young Whitney Elizabeth Houston first showed the vocal range and star quality that would soon make her a legend in the music world. In this film, we pay tribute to one of the most gripping rags to riches stories ever told. We talk to those who knew her as Nippy, retrace her steps to stardom, and revisit some of her most stunning performances. Whitney Houston was so much more than a performer. She was the blessing for all who knew her and who were touched by her genteel soul and kind spirit. She was truly the greatest love of all. The things that Whitney's been able to do that other artists have not been able to do is actually sing. <laughs> she was that original, that young swag, like she was with Rihanna and you know a lot of these young ladies uh, that modeled after the day. Whitney Elizabeth Houston, born August 9th, 1963, was an American recording artist, an actress, a producer, a model, and in 2009, a Guinness World Record holder. They cited her as the most awarded female act of all time. Her awards included two Emmy Awards, six Grammy Awards, 30 Billboard Music Awards, and 22 American Music Awards, among a total of 415 career awards in her lifetime. Houston was also one of the world's best-selling musical artists, having sold over 170 million albums, singles, and videos worldwide. Houston began singing with her New Jersey Church's choir at the age of 11, after she began performing alongside her mother in nightclubs in New York City. She was discovered by an Arista Records label head, Clive Davis. Houston released seven studio albums and three movie soundtrack albums, all of which have diamond, multi-platinum, platinum, or gold certification. Houston is the only artist to chart seven consecutive number one Billboard Hot 100 hits, Saving All My Love For You, How Will I Know, Greatest Love Of All, I Wanna Dance With Somebody Who Loves Me, Didn't We Almost Have It All, So Emotional, and Where Do Broken Hearts Go? She is the second artist behind Elton John and the only female artist to have 200 album awards, formerly the Top Pop Album Award on Billboard Magazine's year-end charts. Artists these days, it's like its image is a lot more important, but Whitney was like all of the talent. She's a really good inspiration. Whitney Houston and the Bodyguard original soundtrack album in 2009, Houston released her seventh studio album, I Look To You. On February 11, 2012, Houston was found dead in her guest room at the Beverly Hilton Hotel in Beverly Hills, California. Whitney Houston was born in what was then a middle-income neighborhood in Newark, New Jersey. The third and youngest child of Army serviceman and entertainment executive John Russell Houston, Jr., who was born September 13, 1920, and died on February 2, 2003, and gospel singer Sissy Houston, Nee Emily Drinkard. She was of mostly African American, as well as distant Native American and Dutch descent. Her mother, along with cousins Dion Warwick and Dee Dee Warwick, and godmother Aretha Franklin, were all notable figures in the gospel, rhythm, blues, pop, and soul genres. Houston was raised a Baptist, but was also exposed to the Pentecostal church. After the 1967 Newark riots, the family moved to a middle-class area in East Orange, New Jersey, when she was just four. I think um, Whitney, the most for her voice and just her talent. And she, um, in trying the different avenues, you know, the movie, she had just back-to-back -back winners. At the age of 11, Houston began to follow in her mother's footsteps and started performing as a soloist in the Junior Gospel Choir at the New Hope Baptist Church in Newark, where she learned to play the piano. Her first solo performance in the church was Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. When Houston was a teenager, she attended Mount St. Dominique Academy, a Catholic girls' high school in Caldwell, New Jersey, where she met her best friend, Robin Crawford, whom she described as 
the sister she never had. While Houston was still in school, her mother continued to teach her how to sing. In addition to her mother, Franklin, and Warwick, Houston was also exposed to the music of Shaka Khan, Gladys Knight, and Roberta Flack, most of whom would have an impact on her as a singer and performer. Houston spent some of her teenage years touring nightclubs where her mother Sissy was performing, and she would occasionally get on stage and perform with her. In 1977, at the age of 14, she became a backup singer on the Michael Zager band's single, Life's a Party. And in 1978, at age 15, Houston sang background vocals on Shaka Khan's hit single, I'm Every Woman, a song she would later turn into a larger hit for herself on her monster-selling The Bodyguard soundtrack album. She also sang backup on albums by Lou Rawls and Jermaine Jackson. In the early 1980s, Houston started working as a fashion model after a photographer saw her at Carnegie Hall singing with her mother. She appeared in Seventeen magazine and became one of the first women of color to grace the cover of that magazine. She also was featured in layouts in the pages of Glamour, Cosmopolitan, Young Miss, and appeared in a Canada Dry soft drink TV commercial. Her striking looks and girl next door charm made her one of the most sought after teen models of that time. While modeling, she continued her burgeoning recording career by working with producers Michael Benhorn, Bill Laswell, and Martin Bisi on an album they were spearheading called One Down, which was credited to the group Material. For that project, Houston contributed the ballad Memories, a cover song by Hugh Hopper of Soft Machine. Robert Christagau of The Village Voice called her contribution one of the most gorgeous ballads you'll ever hear. She also appeared as a lead vocalist on one track on a Paul Jabra album entitled Paul Jabra and Friends, released by Columbia Records in 1983. Houston had previously been offered several recording agency contracts, Michael Zeger in 1980 and Electra Records in 1981. However, her mother declined the offers, stating that her daughter must first complete high school. In 1983, Jerry Griffith, an A&R representative from Arista Records, saw her performing with her mother in a New York City nightclub and was impressed. He convinced Arista's head, Clive Davis, to make time to see Houston perform. Davis, too, was impressed and offered a worldwide recording contract which Houston signed. She was always real, like, you know, she never tried to hide and, and try to pretend she was anything other than what she was. She just didn't care, she didn't give a damn. She was herself all the time, take it or leave it. Later that year, she made her national televised debut alongside Davis on the Merv Griffin Show. Houston signed with Arista in 1983, but did not begin work on her album immediately. The label wanted to make sure no other label signed the singer away. Davis wanted to ensure he had the right material and producers for Houston's debut album. Some producers had to pass on the project due to prior commitments. Houston first recorded a duet with Teddy Pendergrass entitled Hold Me, which appeared on his album Love Language. The single was released in 1984 and gave Houston her first taste of success, becoming a top five R&B hit. It would also appear on her debut album in 1985. I think she was different because she was so creative. Like her, her voice was so different. So I think she's just the pioneer, and that's why she stood out. She was like the queen, the mother of, of music. With production from Michael Masser, Kashif, Jermaine Jackson, and Narita Michael Walden, Houston's debut album, Whitney Houston, was released in February of 1985. Rolling Stone magazine praised Houston, calling her one of the most exciting new voices in years, while the New York Times called the album an impressive, musically conservative showcase for an exceptional vocal talent. Arista Records promoted Houston's album with three different singles from the album in the U.S., U.K., and other European countries. In the U.K., the dance funk Someone For Me, which failed to chart in that country, was the first single while All at Once was in such European countries as the Netherlands and Belgium, where the song reached the top five on the singles charts, respectively. 
In the U.S., the soulful ballad, You Give Good Love, was chosen as the lead single from Houston's debut album to establish her in the black marketplace first. Outside the U.S., the song failed to get enough attention to become a hit, but in the U.S., it gave the album its first major hit as it peaked at number three on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100 chart and number one on the Hot R&B singles charts. As a result, the album began to sell strongly, and Houston continued promotion by touring nightclubs in the U.S. She also began performing on late-night television talk shows, which usually were not accessible to unestablished black acts. The jazzy ballad, Saving All My Love For You, was released next, and it would become Houston's first number one single in both the U.S. and the U.K. In 1986, a year after its initial release, Whitney Houston topped the Billboard 200 Albums chart and stayed there for 14 non-consecutive weeks. The final single, Greatest Love of All, became Houston's biggest hit at the time after peaking to number one and remaining there for three weeks on the Hot 100 charts, which made her debut album the first album by a female artist to yield three number one hits. Houston was the number one artist of the year, and Whitney Houston was the number one album of the year in 1986 on Billboard's year-end charts, making her the first female artist to earn that distinction. At that time, Houston released the best-selling debut album by a solo artist. Houston then embarked on her world tour, The Greatest Love Tour. The album had become an international success and was certified 13 times platinum, diamond in the United States alone, and has sold a total of 25 million copies worldwide. At the 1986 Grammy Awards, Houston was nominated for three awards, including Album of the Year, she was not eligible for the Best New Artist category due to her previous hit, an R&B duet with Teddy Pendergrass in 1984, but she did win her first Grammy Award for Best Pop Vocal Performance Female, Saving All My Love For You. At the same award show, she performed that Grammy-winning hit, that performance later winning her an Emmy Award for Outstanding Individual Performance in a Variety or Music Television Program. Houston won seven American Music Awards in total in 1986 and in 1987 and an MTV Video Music Award. The album's popularity would also carry over to the 1987 Grammy Awards when Greatest Love of All would receive a Record of the Year nomination. Houston's debut album is listed as one of Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Albums of All Time and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame's definitive 200 list. Houston's grand entrance into the music industry is considered one of the 25 musical milestones of the last 25 years, according to USA Today. Following Houston's breakthrough, doors were opened for other African-American female artists such as Janet Jackson and Anita Baker to find notable success in popular music and on MTV. Support to, to her family, to her daughter, and uh... We'll, we'll always love you. I think that's really such a presence, like, your voice is so powerful and so profound that, you know, not a lot of artists have been able to get out there to be as they like. With many expectations, Houston's second album, Whitney, was released in June of 1987. The album again featured production from Masir, Kashif, and Walden, as well as Jellybean Benitez. Many critics complained that the material was too similar to her previous album. Rolling Stone said, the narrow channel through which this talent has been directed is frustrating. Still, the album enjoyed commercial success. Houston became the first female artist in music history to debut at number one on the Billboard 200 Albums charts and the first artist to enter the Albums chart at number one in both the U.S. and the U.K., while also hitting number one or top ten in dozens of other countries around the world. The album's first single, I Wanna Dance With Somebody Who Loves Me, was also a massive hit worldwide, peaking at number one on the Billboard Hot 100 charts and topping the singles chart in many countries such as Australia, Germany, and the UK. The next three singles, Didn't We Almost Have It All, So Emotional, 
and Where Do Broken Hearts Go all peaked at number one on the US Hot 100 chart, which gave her a total of seven consecutive number one hits, breaking the record of six previously shared by the Beatles and the Bee Gees. Houston became the first female artist to generate four number one singles from one album. Whitney has been certified nine times platinum in the US for shipments of over 9 million copies and has sold a total of 20 million copies worldwide. At the 30th Grammy Awards in 1988, Houston was nominated for three awards, including Album of the Year, winning her second Grammy for Best Female Pop Vocal Performance for I Wanna Dance with Somebody Who Loves Me. Houston also won two American Music Awards in 1988 and 1989, respectively, and a Soul Train Music Award following the release of the album. Houston embarked on the Moment of Truth World Tour, which was one of the 10 highest grossing concert tours of 1987. The success of the tours during the 1986 and 87 year and her two studio albums ranked Houston as number eight for the highest earning entertainer list according to Forbes magazine. She was the highest earning African-American woman overall and the third highest entertainer after Bill Cosby and Eddie Murphy. I remember just like that um, song, I wanna dance with somebody, and her just like being like really excited. Uh, what I remember most about Whitney is is probably her, first of all, the anointing of her voice, uh, the uncanny gift, the ability to convey her message to us and her emotions to us. Houston was a supporter of Nelson Mandela and the anti-apartheid movement during her modeling days. The singer refused to work with any agencies who did business with then-apartheid South Africa. On June 11, 1988, during the European leg of her tour, Houston joined other musicians to perform a set at Wembley Stadium in London to celebrate then-imprisoned Nelson Mandela's 70th birthday. Over 72,000 people attended Wembley Stadium and over a billion people tuned in worldwide as the rock concert raised over $1 million for charities while bringing awareness to apartheid. Houston then flew back to the U.S. for a concert at Madison Square Garden in New York City in August. The show was a benefit concert that raised a quarter of a million dollars for the United Negro College Fund. In that same year, she recorded a song for NBC's coverage of the 1988 Summer Olympics, One Moment in Time, which became a top five hit in the US while reaching number one in the UK and in Germany. With her world tour continuing overseas, Houston was still one of the top 20 highest earning entertainers for 1987 and 88, according to Forbes magazine. In 1989, Houston formed the Whitney Houston Foundation for Children, a nonprofit organization that has raised funds for the needs of children all around the world. The organization cares for homelessness, children with cancer or AIDS, and other issues of self-empowerment. With the success of her first two albums, Houston was undoubtedly an international crossover superstar, the most prominent since Michael Jackson, appealing to all demographics. However, some black critics believed that she was selling out. They felt her singing on the record lacked the soul that was present during her live concerts. At the 1989 Soul Train Music Awards, when Houston's name was called out for a nomination, a few in the audience jeered. Houston defended herself against the criticism, stating, if you're gonna have a long career, there's a certain way to do it, and I did it that way. I'm not ashamed of it. Houston took a more urban direction with her third studio album, I'm Your Baby Tonight, released in November of 1990. She produced and chose producers for this album, and as a result, it featured production and collaborations with L.A. Reid and Babyface, Luther Vandross, and Stevie Wonder. The album showed Houston's versatility on a new batch of tough rhythmic grooves, soulful ballads, and up-tempo dance tracks. Reviews were mixed. Rolling Stone felt it was her best and most integrated album, while Entertainment Weekly at the time thought Houston's shift towards an urban direction was superficial. Houston became the first female artist to ever have three singles 
in the top 11 simultaneously. The album was certified platinum 17 times in the U.S. alone, with worldwide sales of 44 million, making The Bodyguard the second album by a female act on the list of the world's top 10 best-selling albums, topping Shania Twain's 40. She was that original, that young swag, like she's with Rihanna and you know a lot of these young ladies uh, that modeled after me. Including two of the Academy's highest honors, Album of the Year and Record of the Year. In addition, she won a record eight American Music Awards that year, including the Award of Merit, Billboard Music Awards, Soul Train Music Awards in 1993 and 94, including the Sammy Davis Jr. Award as the Entertainer of the Year, an NAACP Image Award, including Entertainer of the Year, a record five World Music Awards, and a Brit Award. Following the success of the project, Houston embarked on another expansive global tour, the Bodyguard World Tour. In 1993 and 94, her concerts, movies, and recording grosses made her the third highest earning female entertainer of 1993 and 94. She was just behind Oprah Winfrey and Barbara Streisand, according to Forbes magazine. Houston placed in the top five of Entertainment Weekly's annual Entertainer of the Year ranking and was labeled Premier Magazine's one of the most 100 powerful people in Hollywood. X Factor's massive in the UK, so uh, anyone that ever auditions a woman with a big voice, they always sing when they're Houston. Probably our condolences to her family and friends. In October of 1994, Houston attended and performed at a state dinner in the White House, honoring newly elected South African President Nelson Mandela. At the end of her world tour, Houston performed three concerts in South Africa to honor President Mandela, playing to over 200,000 people. This would make the singer the first major musician to visit the newly unified and apartheid free nation following Mandela's winning election. The concert was broadcast live on HBO with funds of the concert being donated to various charities in South Africa. The event was considered the nation's largest media event since the inauguration of President Mandela. In 1995, Houston starred alongside Angela Bassett, Loretta Devine, and Layla Rashawn in her second film, Waiting to Exhale, a motion picture about four African-American women struggling with relationships Houston played the lead character, Savannah Jackson, a TV producer in love with a married man. She chose the role because she saw the film as a breakthrough for the image of black women because it presents them both as professionals and as caring mothers. After opening at number one and grossing $67 million in the U.S. at the box office and $81 million worldwide, it proved that a movie primarily targeting a black audience can cross over and have huge success while paving the way for other all-black movies such as How Stella Got Her Groove Back and the Tyler Perry movies that have become popular in the 2000s. The film is also notable for its portrayal of black women as strong, middle-class citizens as opposed to stereotypes. The reviews were mainly positive for the ensemble cast. The New York Times wrote, Miss Houston has shed the defensive hauteur that made her portrayal of a pop star in The Bodyguard seem too distant. Houston was nominated for an NAACP Image Award for an outstanding actress in a motion picture, but lost to her co-star, Bassett. The film's accompanying soundtrack, Waiting to Exhale, original soundtrack album, was produced by Houston and Babyface. Though Babyface originally wanted Houston to record the entire album, she declined. Instead, she wanted it to be an album of women with vocal distinction, and thus gathered several African-American female artists for the soundtrack to go along with the film's strong women message. As a result, the album featured a range of contemporary R&B female recording artists along with Houston, such as Mary J. Blige, Aretha Franklin, Tony Braxton, Patti LaBelle, and Brandy. Houston's Excel, Shoop Shoop, peaked at number one and then spent a record 11 weeks at the number two spot and eight weeks on top of the R&B charts. 
Count On Me, a duet with CC Winans, hit the US top 10, and Houston's third contribution, Why Does It Hurt So Bad, made the top 30. The album debuted at number one and was certified platinum seven times over in the United States, denoting shipments of seven million copies. The soundtrack received strong reviews. As Entertainment Weekly said, the album goes down easy, just as you'd expect from a package framed by Whitney Houston's tracks. The soundtrack waits to exhale, hovering in sensuous suspense, and has since ranked as one of the 100 best movie soundtracks of all time. Later that year, Houston's children's charity organization was awarded a VH1 honor for all the charitable work that they had done. In 1996, Houston starred in the holiday comedy The Preacher's Wife with Denzel Washington. She plays the gospel singing wife of a pastor, Courtney B. Vance. It was largely an updated remake of the 1948 film The Bishop's Wife, which starred Loretta Young, David Niven, and Cary Grant. Though Houston was seen as a good girl with a perfect image in the 1980s and early 90s, by the late 1990s, her behavior had changed. She was often hours late for interviews, photo shoots and rehearsals, and canceling concerts and talk show appearances. With the missed performances and the weight loss, rumors about Houston using drugs with her husband circulated. On January 11, 2000, airport security guards discovered marijuana in both Houston's and husband Bobby Brown's luggage at a Hawaii airport. But the two boarded the plane and departed before authorities could arrive. Charges were later dropped against them, but rumors of drug usage between the couple continued to surface. Two months later, Clive Davis was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Houston had been scheduled to perform at the event, but failed to show up. Shortly thereafter, Houston was scheduled to perform at the Academy Awards, but was fired from the event by musical director and longtime friend Burt Bacharach. Her publicist cited throat problems as the reason for the cancellation. In his book, The Big Show, High Times and Dirty Dealings Backstage at the Academy Awards, author Steve Pound revealed that Houston's voice was shaky. She seemed distracted and jittery, and her attitude was casual, almost defiant, and that while Houston was to sing Over the Rainbow, she would start singing a different song. Houston later admitted to having been fired. Later that year, Houston's longtime executive assistant and friend, Robin Crawford, resigned from Houston's management company. In August of 2001, Houston signed the biggest record deal in music history with Arista BMG. She renewed her contract for over $100 million to deliver six new albums on which she would also earn royalties. She later made an appearance on the Michael Jackson 30th anniversary special. Her extremely thin frame spurred rumors of drug use. Houston's publicist said, Whitney has been under stress due to family matters, and when she is under stress, she doesn't eat. The singer was scheduled for a second performance the following night, but canceled. Within weeks, Houston's rendition of the Star Spangled Banner would be re-released after the September 11th attacks with the proceeds donated to the New York Firefighters 9-11 Disaster Relief Fund and the New York Fraternal Order of the Police. The song peaked at number six, this time on the US Hot 100, topping its previous position. In 2002, Houston became involved in a legal dispute with John Houston Enterprise. Although the company was started by her father to manage her career, it was actually run by company president Kevin Skinner, Skinner filed a breach of contract lawsuit and sued for $100 million, but lost, stating that Houston owed the company previously unpaid compensation for helping to negotiate her $100 million contract with Arista Records and for sorting out legal matters. Houston stated that her 81-year-old father had nothing to do with the lawsuit, although Skinner tried to claim otherwise. John Houston never appeared in court. Houston's father later died in February of 2003. The lawsuit was dismissed on April 5th of 2004, and Skinner was awarded nothing. Also in 2002, 
Houston did an interview with Diane Sawyer to promote her then upcoming album. The interview was the highest rated television interview in history. During the primetime special, Houston spoke on topics including rumored drug use and marriage. She was asked about the ongoing drug rumors and replied, first of all, let's get one thing straight. Crack is cheap. I make too much money to ever smoke crack. Let's get that straight, okay? We don't do crack. We don't do that. Crack is whack. The line was from Keith Haring's mural, which was painted in 1986 on the handball court on 128th Street and 2nd Avenue. Houston did, however, admit to using other substances at times, including cocaine. In December of 2002, Houston released her fifth studio album, Just Whitney. The album included productions from then-husband Bobby Brown, as well as Missy Elliott and Babyface, and marked the first time that Houston did not produce with Clive Davis, as Davis had been released by top management at BMG. Upon its release, Just Whitney received mixed reviews. The album debuted at number nine on the Billboard 200 chart, and it had the highest first week sales of any album that Houston had ever released. The four singles released from the album didn't fare well on the Billboard 100 charts, but became hot dance club play hits. Just Whitney was certified platinum in the United States and sold approximately 3 million worldwide. On a June 2003 trip to Israel, Houston said of her visit, I've never felt like this in any other country. I feel at home. I feel wonderful. In late 2003, Houston released her first Christmas album, One Wish, the holiday album. With a collection of traditional holiday songs, Houston produced the album with Mervyn Warren and Gordon Chambers. A single titled One Wish for Christmas reached the top 20 on the adult contemporary charts. The album was certified gold in the U.S., having always been a touring artist. Houston spent most of 2004 touring and performing in Europe, the Middle East, Asia, and in Russia. In September of 2004, she gave a surprise performance at the World Music Awards in a tribute to a longtime friend, Clive Davis. After the show, Davis and Houston announced plans to go into the studio to work on her new album. In early 2004, husband Bobby Brown starred in his own reality TV program, Being Bobby Brown, on the Bravo Network, which provided a view into the domestic goings-on in the Brown household. Though it was Brown's vehicle, Houston was a prominent figure throughout the show, receiving as much screen time as Brown. The series aired in 2005 and featured Houston in what some would say not her most flattering moments. The Hollywood Reporter said it was undoubtedly the most disgusting and exacerbable series ever to ooze its way onto television. Despite the perceived train wreck nature of the show, the series gave Bravo its highest ratings in its time slot and continued Houston's successful forays into film and television. The show was not renewed for a second season after Houston stated that she would no longer appear in it and Brown and Bravo could not come to an agreement for another season. After years of controversy and turmoil, Houston separated from Bobby Brown in September of 2006, filing for divorce the following month. On February 1st, 2007, Houston asked the court to fast track their divorce. The divorce was finalized on April 24, 2007, with Houston granted custody of the couple's daughter. On May 4, Houston sold the suburban Atlanta home featured in Being Bobby Brown for $1.19 million. A few days later, Brown sued Houston in Orange County, California court in an attempt to change the terms of their custody agreement. Brown also sought child and spousal support from Houston in the lawsuit. Brown claimed that financial and emotional problems prevented him from properly responding to Houston's divorce petition. Brown lost at his court hearing and the judge dismissed his appeal to overrule the custody terms, leaving Houston with full custody and Brown with no spousal support. In March of 2007, Clyde Davis of Arista Records announced that Houston would begin recording a new album. 
in October of 2007, Arista released another compilation, the Ultimate Collection, outside of the United States. Houston gave her first interview in seven years in September of 2009, appearing on Oprah Winfrey's season premiere. The interview was billed as the most anticipated music interview of the decade. Whitney admitted on the show to using drugs with former husband Bobby Brown, who laced marijuana with rock cocaine. By 1996, she told Oprah, doing drugs was an everyday thing. I wasn't happy, but by that point, I was losing myself. Houston released her new album, I Look To You, in August of 2009. The album's first two singles are I Look To You and Million Dollar Bill. The album entered the Billboard 200 at number one with Houston's best opening week sales of 305,000 copies, marking Houston's first number one album since The Bodyguard. Houston appeared on the Italian version of The X Factor, performing the same song, Million Dollar Bill, to excellent reviews. She was awarded a gold certificate for achieving over 50,000 CD sales of I Look To You in Italy. In November, Houston performed I Didn't Know My Own Strength at the 2009 American Music Awards in Los Angeles, California. Two days later, Houston performed both songs on the Dancing With The Stars season nine finale. As of December of 2009, I Look To You has been certified platinum by RIAA for sales of more than 1 million copies in the United States. On January 26, 2010, her debut album was re-released in a special edition entitled Whitney Houston, The Deluxe Anniversary Edition. Houston later embarked on a world tour entitled The Nothing But Love World Tour. It was her first world tour in over 10 years and was announced as a triumphant comeback. However, some poor reviews and rescheduled concerts brought some negative media attention. Houston canceled some of the concerts due to illness and received widespread negative reviews from fans who were disappointed in the quality of her voice and performance. Some fans reportedly walked out of her concerts. In January 2010, Houston was nominated for two NAACP Image Awards one for Best Female Artist and one for Best Music Video. She won the award for Best Music Video for her single, I Look To You. On January 16th, she received the BET Honors Award for Entertainer, citing her lifetime of achievements spanning over 25 years in the industry. The 2010 BET Honors Award was held at the Warner Theater in Washington, D.C. and aired on February 1st, 2010. Jennifer Hudson and Kim Burrell performed in honor of her, garnering positive reviews. Houston also received a nomination from the Echo Awards, Germany's version of the Grammys, for the Best International Artist. And in April of 2010, the UK newspaper The Mirror reported that Houston was thinking about recording her eighth studio album and wanted to collaborate with Will I Am of the Black Eyed Peas, her first choice for a collaboration. Houston also performed the song, I Look To You, on the 2011 BET Celebration of Gospel with gospel jazz singer Kim Burrell, held at the Staples Center in Los Angeles. The performance aired on January 30th, 2011. Early in 2011, she gave an uneven performance in tribute to cousin Dionne Warwick at music mogul Clive Davis's annual pre-Grammy gala. In May of 2011, Houston enrolled in a rehabilitation center again as an outpatient, citing drug and alcohol problems. A representative for Houston said that it was part of Houston's long-standing recovery process. In September of 2011, The Hollywood Reporter announced that Houston was to produce and star alongside Jordan Sparks and Mike Epps in the remake of the 1976 film Sparkle. It was also reported that Houston would play Sparks, not so encouraging mother. Houston was to have had executive producer credits on top of acting credits, according to Deborah Martin Chase, producer of Sparkle. She stated that Houston deserved the title, considering she had been there from the beginning in 2001 when Houston obtained Sparkle production rights. R&B singer Aaliyah's death in 2001 in a plane crash derailed production, which would have begun in 2002. On October 7, 
2011, RCA Music Group announced that it was disbanding Arista Records, along with J Records and Jive Records. With the shutdown, future material involving Houston was to have been released on the RCA Records brand. The Clive Davis party that Houston was expected to attend and that featured many of the biggest names in the music and the movies went on as scheduled, although it was quickly turned into a tribute to Houston. Davis spoke about Houston's death at the evening's start. By now, you have all learned of the unspeakably tragic news of our beloved Whitney's passing. I don't have to mask my emotion in front of a room so full of my many dear friends. I am personally devastated by the loss of someone who has meant so much to me for so many years. Whitney was so full of life. She was looking forward to tonight even though she wasn't scheduled to perform. Whitney was a beautiful person and a talent beyond compare. She graced this stage with her regal presence and gave so many memorable performances here over the years. Simply put, Whitney would have wanted the music to go on and her family asked that we carry on. Tony Bennett, who had a drug addiction problem in the 1970s, spoke of Houston's death before performing at Davis's party. He said, first it was Michael Jackson, then Amy Winehouse, and now magnificent Whitney Houston. Tying it into his public stance in favor of legalizing drugs, Bennett sang, how do you keep the music playing? And said of Houston, when I first heard her, I called Clive Davis and said, Clive, you finally found the greatest singer I've ever heard in my life. Several other celebrities released statements responding to Houston's death. Dolly Parton, whose song, I Will Always Love You, was covered by Houston, said, I will always be grateful and in awe of the wonderful performance she did on my song. And I can truly say from the bottom of my heart, Whitney, I will always love you. You will be missed. Houston's godmother, Aretha Franklin said, it's so stunning. And unbelievable. I couldn't believe what I was reading coming across the TV screen. Mariah Carey said, heartbroken and in tears over the shocking death of my friend. She will never be forgotten as she is one of the greatest voices to ever grace the earth. Moments after news of her death emerged, CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News all broke from their regularly scheduled programming to dedicate time to non-stop coverage of Houston's death. All three featured live interviews with people who knew Houston, including those who have worked with her, interviewed her, along with some of her peers in the music industry. Saturday Night Live displayed a still photo in silent reverence of a smiling Houston, alongside Molly Shannon from her 1996 appearance. MTV and VH1 interrupted their regularly scheduled programming on Sunday, February 12th to air many of Houston's classic videos, with MTV often airing news segments in between and featuring various reactions from fans and celebrities. Houston's former husband, Bobby Brown, was reported to be in and out of crying fits since receiving the news. He did not cancel a scheduled performance and within hours of his ex-wife's sudden death, an audience in Mississippi observed as Brown Blue kisses skyward, tearfully saying, I love you, Whitney. Ken Elric, executive producer of the 54th Grammy Awards, announced that Jennifer Hudson would perform a tribute to Houston at the February 12, 2012 awards. He said, event organizers believe that Hudson an Academy Award-winning actress and Grammy Award-winning artist could perform a respectful musical tribute to Houston. Eric went on to say, it's too fresh in everyone's memory to do more at this time, but we would be remiss if we didn't recognize Whitney's remarkable contribution to music fans in general, and in particular, her close ties with the Grammy telecast and her Grammy wins and nominations over the years. At the start of the award ceremony, footage of Houston performing was shown following a prayer read by host LL Cool J. Later in the program, following a montage of photos of musicians who had died in 2011. Hudson paid tribute to Houston 
and the other artist by performing I Will Always Love You. Houston was a mezzo-soprano and was commonly referred to as The Voice in reference to her exceptional vocal talent. Her vocal range extended from G below middle C to high B flat. She could belt out a treble F. She was third in MTV's list of the 22 greatest voices and sixth on online magazine's Cove list and sixth on online magazine Cove's list of the 100 best pop vocalists with a score of 48.5 out of 50. In 2008, Rolling Stone listed Houston as the 34th of the 100 greatest singers of all time, stating, her voice is a mammoth, coruscating cry. Few vocalists could get away with opening a song with 45 unaccompanied seconds of singing. But Houston's powerhouse version of Dolly Parton's I Will Always Love You is a tour de force. Mariah Carey stated, Whitney has a really rich, strong mid-belt that very few people have. She sounds really, really good and strong. While in her review of I Look To You, music critic Ann Powers of the Los Angeles Times writes, Houston's voice stands like monuments upon the landscape of 20th century pop, defining the architecture of their times, sheltering the dreams of millions and inspiring and climbing careers of countless imitators. Adding, when she was at her best, nothing could match her huge, clean, cool mezzo soprano. Houston's vocal stylings have had a significant impact on the music industry. She has been called the queen of pop for her influence in the 1990s, commercially rivaling Mariah Carey and Celine Dion. Stephen Holden from the New York Times in his review of Houston's Radio City Music Hall concert in July of 1993, praised her attitude as a singer highly writing Whitney Houston is one of the few contemporary pop stars of whom it might be said the voice suffices. While almost every performer whose albums sell in the millions calls upon an entertainer's bag of tricks from telling jokes to dancing to circus pyrotechnics, Miss Houston would rather just stand there and sing. He added, the comments on her singing style, her stylistic trademarks, chivalry, melismas that ripple up in the middle of a song, twirling embellishment at the ends of phrases that suggest an almost breathless exhilaration, infuse her interpretations with flashes of musical and emotional lighting. Elsa Gardner of the Los Angeles Times, in her review for the Preacher's Wife soundtrack, praised Houston's vocal ability highly, commenting, she is the first and foremost pop diva. At that, the best one we have. No other female pop star, not Mariah Carey, not Celine Dion, not Barbara Streisand, quite rivals Houston in her exquisite vocal fluidity and purity of tone and her ability to infuse a lyric with mesmerizing melodrama. During the 1980s, MTV was coming into its own and received harsh criticism for not playing enough videos by black artists. With Michael Jackson breaking down the color barrier for black male artists, Houston did the same thing for black female artists. She became one of the few black female artists to receive heavy rotation on the network following the success of How Will I Know. That video following Houston's breakthrough, other African American female artists such as Janet Jackson and Ania Baker were successful in popular music. Baker commented that because of what Whitney and Sade did, there was an opening for me for radio stations. Black women singers aren't taboo anymore. All Music additionally noted her contribution to the success of black artists on the pop scene, commenting, Houston was able to handle big adult contemporary ballads, effervescent, stylish, dance, pop, and slick urban contemporary soul with equal dexterity. The result was an across-the-board appeal that was matched by few artists of her era and helped her become one of the first black artists to find success on MTV 
In Michael Jackson's wake, the New York Times stated that Houston was a major catalyst for a movement within black music that recognized the continuity of soul, pop, jazz, and gospel vocal traditions. Richard Corliss of Time Magazine commented about her first success breaking various barriers. On her first album's 10 cuts, six were ballads. This chanting noose Houston had to fight for airplay with hard rockers. The young lady had to stand uncowed in the locker room of Macho Rock the soul strutter had to seduce a music audience that anointed few black artists with superstardom. She was a phenomenon waiting to happen, a canny tapping of the listener's yin for a return to the musical middle. And because every new star creates her own genre, her success has helped other blacks, other women, other smooth singers find an avid reception in the pop marketplace. According to the New York Times, Houston revitalized the tradition of strong gospel-oriented pop soul singing, and Powers of the Los Angeles Times referred to the singer as a national treasure. She was considered by many to be a singer-singer who had an influence on countless other vocalists, both female and male. Similarly, Steve Huey from All Music wrote that the shadow of Houston's prodigious technique still looms large over nearly every pop diva and smooth urban soul singer, male or female, in her wake and spawned a legion of imitators. Rolling Stone on her biography stated that Houston redefined the image of the female soul icon and inspired singers ranging from Mariah Carey to Beyonce. Essence ranked Houston the fifth on their list of 50 most influential R&B stars of all time, calling her the diva to end all divas. A number of artists have acknowledged Houston as an influence, including Celine Dion, Mariah Carey, Tony Braxton, Christina Aguilera. Mariah Carey, who was often compared to Houston, said, Houston has been a big influence on me. She later told USA Today, that none of us would sound the same if Aretha Franklin hadn't ever put out a record or Whitney Houston hadn't. Mary J. Blige said that Houston inviting her on stage during VH1's Divas Live show in 1999 opened the doors for her all over the world. Brandy stated, the first Whitney Houston CD was genius. That CD introduced the world to her angelic yet powerful voice. Without Whitney, Half of this generation of singers wouldn't be singing. Kelly Rowland, in an Ebony feature article celebrating black music in June of 2006, recalled that I wanted to be a singer after I saw Whitney Houston on TV singing, greatest love of all. I wanted to sing like Whitney Houston in that red dress. She added that I have never ever forgotten that song, greatest love of all. I learned it backwards, forwards, sideways, the video still brings chills to me. When you wish and pray for something as a kid, you never know what blessings God will give you. Beyonce told The Globe and The Mail that Houston inspired her to get up there and do what she did. Alicia Keys in an interview about her album, The Element of Freedom with Billboard magazine, also said, Whitney is an artist who inspired me from the time I was a little girl. Oscar winner Jennifer Hudson cites Houston as her biggest musical influence. She told Newsday that she learned from Houston the difference between being able to sing and knowing how to sing. Liana Lewis, who has been called the new Whitney Houston, also cites her as an influence. Lewis stated that she idolized her as a little girl. American recording artist Lady Gaga said that Houston had been one of her vocal idols for years in an interview with IBN Live. Gaga revealed that she used to listen to Houston's version of the Star Spangled Banner over and over again. At the 2011 Grammys, Gaga gave a shout out to Houston and said that she wrote the song Born This Way thinking about Houston's vocals. Houston was the most awarded female artist of all time according to Guinness Book of World Records, with two Emmy Awards, six Grammy Awards, 30 Billboard Music Awards, 22 American Music Awards, among a total of 415 career awards as of 2010. 
She held the all-time record for the most American Music Awards of any female solo artist and shared the record with Michael Jackson for the most AMAs ever won in a single year with eight in 1984. Houston won a record 11 Billboard Music Awards at its fourth ceremony in 1993. She also had the record for the most WMAs won in a single year, winning five awards at the sixth World Music Awards in 1994. In May of 2003, Houston placed at number three on VH1's list of the 50 greatest women of the video era behind Madonna and Janet Jackson. She was also ranked at number 116 on their list of the 200 greatest pop culture icons of all time. In 2008, Billboard magazine released a list of the Hot 100 all-time top artists to celebrate its U.S. singles charts 50th anniversary, ranking Houston at number nine. Similarly, she was ranked as the top 100 greatest artist of all time by VH1 in September of 2010. In November of 2010, Billboard released its top 50 R&B hip hop artists of the past 25 years and listed Houston at number three, who not only went on to earn eight number one singles on the R&B hip hop songs chart, but also landed five number ones on the R&B hip hop album chart. Houston's debut album is listed as one of the 500 greatest albums of all time by Rolling Stone magazine and is on Rock and Roll Hall of Fame's definitive 200 list. In 2004, Billboard picked the success of her first release on the charts as one of the 110 musical milestones in world history. Houston's entrance into the music industry is considered one of the 25 musical milestones of the last 25 years, according to USA Today in 2007. It stated that she paved the way for Mariah Carey's chart-topping vocal gymnastics. In 1997, the Franklin School in East Orange, New Jersey was renamed to the Whitney E. Houston Academy School of Creative and Performing Arts. In 2001, Houston was the first artist ever to be given a BET Lifetime Achievement Award. Houston was also one of the world's best-selling music artists, having sold over 200 million albums and singles worldwide. Although she released relatively few albums, she was ranked as the fourth best-selling female artist in the United States by the Recording Industry Association of America, with 55 million certified albums sold in the U.S., alone. She held an honorary doctorate in humanities from Grambling State University in Louisiana. While there were many who were shocked at the passing of Whitney Houston, her career and life will be remembered not by how she died, but by how she lived, the lives she touched, and the joy she brought to millions. A joy that will only be matched by the new legion of fans that discover her music and movie performances and are touched as well. All of us are better for knowing Whitney Elizabeth Nippy Houston. She was truly the greatest love of all. For Vision Black Entertainment, I'm Theron K. Cal.